Okay, good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. Good to see some friendly faces here, uh, who I remember, and to enjoy meeting those who I haven't met yet. Okay, so I'll begin with a quick poll. How many of you have ever visited a zoo, an aquarium, an arboretum, or a natural history museum? Okay, I see lots of hands. I'm not sure every single hand went up. I kind of gamed the system on that a little bit, but uh, clearly what I was after is that these are locations where you can see current uh, examples of Earth's biodiversity or past examples. I hope you enjoyed those experiences. Maybe your students went along with you. But uh, if you went on your own, the question is, why did you even decide to go to one of these places? And in a way, that relates to, I think, uh, the core of my seminar topic. So first, a little personal history. I was born in Philadelphia. I spent my early childhood in Oakland, California, and I grew up mostly on the outskirts of Syracuse, New York. And all those three locations, they happen to have excellent zoos. So I remember uh, these were some of my favorite places to go as a kid and experience biodiversity. And I think it really fueled my curiosity for biology. And then much later, uh, I pursued a PhD originally in biology at Cal Irvine in Southern California. And it struck me that uh, when I was helping to mentor a campus visit in the summer by students from uh, underserved high schools in central Los Angeles, especially from Compton, this was a prep program that helped improve their chances of admission to Cal Irvine or to other schools and to college STEM programs. So we ended up taking this field trip to the seashore to go tide pooling, which is maybe a phrase that you've heard of. And it struck me that many of these students had never visited the beach before in their lives, or certainly didn't remember having ever gone there, even though they lived pretty close to the Pacific shoreline. And therefore, they didn't see, uh, they didn't have this opportunity to observe biodiversity through just peering into tide pools during low tide. You can see all these creatures and, that are uh, you know, making a living or trying to eke out a living until the, uh, the tide rises again. So I, I found that profoundly interesting to me, and I never, uh, I never forgot that experience. So this relates to the topic in that I think biodiversity is something that's inherently interesting to people, at least they're mildly interested in it, if not fascinated by it, even if they rarely have the time uh, or availability, availability to see it up close. And yet I find this is um, a bit ironic because the impact of humans on the environment is mostly negative. So we're altering natural habitats to an extent that other species are threatened or increasingly driven extinct, so much so that the current geological age is now called the Anthropocene, or the age of humans, because of the reduced biodiversity caused by our actions. Historically, geological time periods uh, were defined purely from the fossil record, and now it's being defined by our actions on the planet and how we are impacting biodiversity that's around us. So the question is, does it even matter in a way? Is it really our role as humans to preserve biodiversity around us, to act as so-called caretakers of the earth, which is certainly a sentiment that's inherent to most major religions and creation stories that I'm familiar with? Or is this just some collateral damage of our species uh, improving our own lot? And as we continue to evolve as the ones who are dominating the planet, and we're, we have other concerns that are vitally important, like feeding a growing human population, that demands more food and greater resources for energy. So I want uh, the teachers who participate in the seminar to um, examine this topic with me. And it concerns the many ways that our human actions are impacting biodiversity that surrounds us and to design curriculum units that are suitable for K through 12 classrooms, allowing them to consider the matter and to wrestle with it, the students in those classrooms. So let me give a couple of quick examples. Climate change and global warming, we hear about these all the time. This uh, causes many species to either adapt in their behavior, and change where they occur geographically, or they are essentially fated for extinction. So the evidence of this is pretty profound if you look at the studies that have examined it. Many plants are already showing changes in their flowering times. They're showing changes in the locations where they can grow. And this does not always coincide with age-old distributions of their uh, insect pollinators. So this threatens natural plant communities, but it also impacts food security because agriculture can fail and even cause human populations to abandon places where they've lived for millennia and they're now displaced because they can't grow any food locally. Other examples include geographic spread of mosquitoes and ticks to more northern latitudes 
where the warmer conditions allow them to thrive, but to also transmit diseases. And uh, the movement of marine creatures is happening so that uh, fisheries are impacted. A uh, local example would be lobsters have already moved out of Long Island Sound. And uh, that's a shame, but if they continue to move northward, Maine lobster may no longer have any meaningful, uh, any meaning as a phrase. So as we crave better technology, as we generate more e-waste or electronic waste, as we crave more energy solutions and food preservatives, this increases air, land, and water pollutants, as well as chemical toxins. So these can have negative uh, impacts on the health of other creatures, but also on humans, especially those in impoverished communities that have little voice in stating, not in my backyard. Interesting, interestingly to me, at least, some creatures are better capable than others in dealing with this environmental change. I'd say that seagulls, house mice, weedy plants, feral dogs and cats, and even large carnivores like coyotes and bears are handling the changes pretty well. However, their increased populations can drive other species extinct, and humans can be threatened by increased encounters with these creatures. Last, it's important to remember that humans have long benefited from harnessing natural products that come from the biodiversity that surrounds us. Aspirin, for example, comes originally from shrubs that naturally produce salicylic acid. Quinine that is used to treat malaria comes from the bark of the cinchona tree. And uh, antibiotics have, sa have saved countless lives. And these are products that are derived from the natural microbial diversity on Earth. So clearly, traditional and modern medicines have benefited from bioprospecting or the search for natural products of plants, animals, and microbes that can benefit humans. And perhaps the greatest irony of the Anthropocene is that we now have a geological period named for our species, but our actions threaten the possibility for future generations to do the bioprospecting that has made us so successful and got us here in the first place. So we will read book chapters, magazine articles, uh, and similar on the seminar topic. Uh, I always consider it my goal to keep an eye out for the relevance of these biology topics in literature, cartoons, TV and movies, popular music, ways to kind of liven up the discussion and make it increasingly fun uh, to, to see how this impacts our many walks of life. So I think the seminar topic is relevant for all K through 12 teachers who instruct in biology and the environmental sciences. Thank you.